Hi everyone, my name is David Rao and I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. You can also find my ideas on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and a variety of other places when you search for my name, David Rao or Make Moments Matter. Um, I'm excited to be sharing with y'all um, this week some of my um, ideas for uh, Jazz Appreciation Month, which is next month, but um, if you want books or resources or things like that, it's um, smart to start looking for those now. So I'm going to share some of those ideas um, with y'all today. And then also I'm going to talk about like the polar opposites. I'm going to talk about kindergarten and then also about fifth grade. So those are my plans uh, to give us a uh, sort of idea of what, what's coming. Um, but before I get to any of that, if you have any um, questions, comments, thoughts along the way, please leave those in the chat. If you're like, hey, what's that book or what's that thing he's using? Um, if you go to um, either the bottom of the, the caption for this video, uh, podcast, whatever, however you're accessing this content, um, there should be a link there, a direct link or Instagram. It's at my LinkedIn profile. Um, but there's a whole page on my blog dedicated to the links and things that I share in these videos. You can also go to makemomentsmatter.org and just click on the video tab. You should be able to find it there. Okay, so that's there. Um, also, if you want, there's a Facebook group called Every Moment Matters Music Education Community. Um, and it's a place where you can go and ask questions and make friends and learn new things. And hopefully it's a place where uh, you can come together and, um, I don't know, just be a better musician, but ask questions and not feel like worried that I have to ask questions and get a weird answer. It's a, it's a fun group, lots of great people, great ideas. Um, last week when I started my video, I forgot to plug in my microphone and now I'm paranoid. So if you're on Facebook and you're watching this, if you could just like put a thumbs up or something so that I know that like you're actually hearing me, that'd be cool. Um, <laughs> just thought I would check because last week I somehow forgot and anyway, it works great. <laughs> um, just thought I would, would check. Okay. So my plan for the week. Um, is to talk first about jazz history, jazz appreciation month, and then start sharing some um, lesson ideas for kinder and fifth grade. So there are a lot of books that you can use. Um, April is officially jazz appreciation month, but there are a lot of books that you can use um, that are great for the classroom that can be used in a variety of lessons, different grade levels. And I wanted to share some of those books tonight just to start out because I know that like jazz appreciation month is next month. A lot of people don't necessarily know or care that <laughs> it's April. I mean, you can talk about jazz any time of the year. So um, I wanted to share some of these books now in case you do want to use them next month. You have lead time to go. Um, find them at your local library, get them at a discount book website, whatever, so that you have access to these books when you need them. So um, let's talk about some of my favorites. So let me set this one to the side here. There are a ton of books you could use. One of the things I love about um, children's books is that you can learn about a lot of people and a lot of things um, through those books. And there's some really, really great like musician biography books. Um, and so that, that's usually my go-to when I'm talking with, with kids about jazz. Um, uh, so uh, it's, I like being able to, um, to talk about musicians and, and learn about their history um, and that really gives students, um, it gives them like a, a, like a good framework for what that thing is. Okay. Sorry. Facebook is telling me something. It's, it's being sassy at me. You know what? I'm just going to ignore it. I'm just going to ignore it. It's going to be fine. <laughs> I hope it works. Again, no one on Facebook has given me a thumbs up. So I hope you can hear me <laughs> anyway. Okay. Sorry. Uh, tangent. So, um, so books about jazz artists, there are also books that give you a little bit of context about what jazz is and jazz history. So uh, let me see if I can cherry pick a couple things out of here. Um, so if you want a good like general book, um, there are a couple that I really like, uh, but the one that, that jumps to mind is this one, um, J is for Jazz. Um, this is written by Anne Ingalls and illustrated by uh, Maria Court uh, Meidegan. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Um, but the illustrations are just really, really beautiful in this book. Um, so it's at the beginning, it says like the story of jazz and there's a little bit of history. And then it goes on each page. It's an alphabet book. So A is for America's music. It's absolute, absolutely began with African-American rhythms and how 
B is for the blues, the heart of jazz. Its sad, simple sound helped give jazz its flavor. Some of the best jazz cats have been hip to the blues. C is for Count Basie, the jazz pianist and songwriter. The Count said, if you play a tune and a person don't tap their feet, don't play the tune. So love it because it's an alphabet book. Those are always a hit, right? Um, I also love that it doesn't just say like, D is for Duke Ellington, next thing. E is for Elephant Jazz. No, like it gives a little bit of history and context about each thing and why it's saying that specific thing. So that's really cool. Um, but also just the illustrations are absolutely eye-catching and amazing. Um, super, super fun. It goes into a lot of different areas. Quartets, quintets, ragtime, spirituals, um, uptown, upbeat, upscale, urban, T is for Thelonious Monk. I mean, so like, it's just a, it's a super cool book. Um, even gets in like, you know, Lionel Hampton playing the vibraphones and, um, oh yeah. And then it has at the end, it has a glossary of jazz slang. So if there's like anything that you're like, mm, I don't, um, you know, axe instrument, bebop, complicated rhythmic, melodic, and harmonic type of jazz that developed in 1940. So like, it's, it's a great, um, great glossary, sort of helpful there at the end. So cool. Love it. Great book. Um, J is for jazz as a fun alphabet book, um, to use with your kiddos. Okay, um, then let's talk about some musician um, books, things that, ooh, ooh, sorry. Um, another one that you might consider using is Jazz on a Saturday Night uh, by Leo and Diane Dillon. Um, this one is a little bit more general. Um, so the introduction gives a little bit about jazz. And then the couple first couple pages. On stage, the musicians open their cases, set up their instruments, take their places. Spotlight's on, the announcer sweeps into sight. You're in for a session of magic tonight. Ladies and gents, what a jam this will be, an evening of jazz, immortality. The audience hushes, they worked all week long, it's their time to hear jazz, now along comes a song. And first note surprise, then they sweeten and rise, Miles Davis on trumpet sparks heat up to the skies. Or sp sparks heat up the skies, wow, I'm reading so well tonight. Toes tapping, hands clapping, now sway left and right, because you move to the music on Saturday night. So rhyming book gives context, talks a little bit about what jazz is along the way. Um, a lot of different musicians show up in here. Um, so super cool. Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane. I mean, like all different sorts of things in here. So again, great book, more general, right? Um, and so that's a, a great to have some, some books that are like um, a little bit more history in general. Then you can get into specific artists if you want. Um, one of my favorites is Charlie Parker played Bebop by Chris Rashka. And this, I like this one, especially because Charlie Parker was born in Kansas City. So like to say to my students, he was born like 15 miles away from where we currently are. Like this is, it's fun to have um, a book about somebody who has a connection to where you are. And so this is a great book for us in Kansas City. Charlie Parker played Bebop. Also, there is a uh, reading rainbow about this and uh, you um, you can also do maybe there's I'm maybe I'm thinking a different book no I'm pretty sure it's this book plus also there's a between the lions or so there's another like children's thing where it's it's on YouTube if you want to pair this book with that um, let's see another one I love oh here's another one a great one for Kansas City again little Melba and her big trombone this is another just super cool book. Again, the pictures are amazing. Um, but this one, let's go a couple pages in. From as far back as her memory would go, Melba loved the sounds of music. Blues, jazz, and gospel rhythms danced in her head. The plink of a guitar, the hum of a bass, the thrum thrum of a drum, the ping pang of a piano, the tremble of a sweet horn. Notes stirred and rhythms bubbled all through Melba's home. She couldn't get enough. Music was always on her mind. She daydreamed about beats and lyrics. Music was on Melba's mind at night, too, when she should have been fast asleep. So it goes in, talks about how she wants to play trombone. I think she was discouraged at first. They're like, mm, I should get some of this. And then she went with the trombone. Um, yeah, they, she was sort of discouraged. But it, it's this great story. Um, tells about how she... Uh, you know, came into fame and, and, and like the story of her development, super cool. But I also just love like the picture in the front is so amazing. I mean, like to, to show uh, all of our kids, you know, you can play whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. It's a super cool book. 
Also, this one, you can see half price books. You don't have to buy them from Amazon. You can. There's a, I, I have a link to on the links page to on Amazon. I use it sort of like Pinterest. There's a whole list of just jazz books um, and or books for Women's History Month or books about musician biographies. And so um, you can buy them on Amazon, but you don't have to. So anyway, that's the <laughs> there if you want. But I bought this one at half price books. Go for it. Buy them online. Buy them wherever. But um, I... If you go to Amazon, you can peel off the publisher's name, the ISBN, all the identifying information, and then buy it wherever you want. Anyway, great book. Little Mel about her big trombone. Um, let's see. That's another great one. Um, oh, uh, let's see. If we're talking about women jazz, there's this one, Swing Sisters, the story of the international sweethearts of rhythm. I talked about this a couple weeks ago for Women's History Month. It would also be perfect for jazz. Um, and it sort of just talks about the first all-female big band group that sort of made it big. Um, or at least made a splash. Swing Sisters, talked about that one already. Um, here's another one that I like using, um, Dizzy by uh, Jonah Winter, illustrated by Sean Qualls. I know I've talked about this one before in like the fall. Um, it's a great book. Um, it goes through and talks about, obviously Dizzy Gillespie, it talks about how he was he fought when he was little and um, he had troubles at home. It talks about how the he used the he used this instrument he used making music to sort of change his life and all the things that um, inspired him and changed him along the way. So it's it's just a really cool book. I like the illustrations. It's fun. I just also like Dizzy Gillespie. I like his story and I like um, you know how he didn't take himself too seriously. You know like he was trying to have fun and be fun and make music a, a fun experience for the people he played for. So it's just a, a, another super cool book, um, especially if you're going to feature musicians. This is a great one, Dizzy. And it's big, which is great if you're in the front of the room. And, you know, like, it's nice to, like, not have to worry about can the kids in the back see. You should, they should be able to because um, the illustrations are really easy to see, and it's a bigger book. Love that. Um, let's see. Okay, two more. Um, Before John was a jazz giant, story of John Coltrane. Um, this is another one I love. Carol Boston Weatherford, illustrated by Sean Qualls. Again, ooh, hey, same illustrator. What? Um, but this is one that I really love, and I share this a lot often, oftentimes with my um, kinder first grade. I've used it before as a sub lesson. Um, it's just a, a great book to have and read just a couple pages. Before John was a jazz giant... He heard hand bones knocking in grandma's pots, daddy strumming the ukulele, and mama cranking the phonograph. Before John was a jazz giant, he heard steam engines whistling past, cousin Mary giggling at jitterbuggers, and Bojangles tap dancing in the picture show. Before John was a jazz giant, he heard Grandpa's Sunday sermons, Mama playing hymns for the senior choir, and the Scoutmaster's call to join a band. So it's it's cool because it like talks about what he heard, what his influences were, how that affected his sound, how that affected what he did. Um, very accessible for younger grades, fun pictures. I like to leave it for a sub and then have some sort of like um, activities to go along with it. Um, but great book to have. Um, before John was a jazz giant. And speaking of sub stuff, I have one more book I want to share and then the specific sub things I leave. Okay, so um, this one is The Music in George's Head. It's about George Gershwin and how he sort of came up with Rhapsody in Blue. Um, it's another one that, that reminds me of Before John was a jazz giant because it talks about like the sounds he heard that inspired him. Um, and again, just really, really cool illustrations. George, this is maybe not a good one for emergent readers because it's written in cursive and the, the words are not always in a great place for kids who are like struggling reading. So like this is definitely one that you're going to want to read or want to have a sub read. George heard music all the time at home, at school, even when he was roller skating down New York's busy streets. Sometimes he was so busy listening to the beautiful music in his head. He didn't pay attention to other things, like getting to school on time. Now George wasn't a troublemaker. He just couldn't stop thinking about Melody in F, a classical tune he'd heard at the Penny Arcade. No one knew George was interested in music until his mother decided the family needed a piano. George's older brother, Ira, took one look at the second-hand instrument and headed to his room. But George ran to the piano, spun the stool down, and lifted the keyboard cover. When he felt those smooth keys beneath his fingers, his face lit up like the lights on Broadway. Without a word, he pounded out a popular ragtime tune. 
His mother was amazed. She had no idea he'd been practicing on a friend's player piano. So it goes through, it talks about his influences, his life. It talks about what it, uh, inspired him to do Rhapsody in Blue. Um, specifically, it talks about like when he heard the train tracks and the, the rattles and bangs and the things and how that influenced him and influenced specific parts of Rhapsody in Blue. So super cool. Um, again, talking about outside influences. And it's great because it helps kids think about like how does a composer get inspired and how do they... Um, you know, like how do they use that to influence what they create and how do they make music, which is just awesome. So I, I really like this book, The Music in George's Head. And actually a couple, um, where did I put them? Oh yeah. Um, a couple months ago, I was like, I want to use this for a sub all the time every year. Um, and so I added, um, I created this thing called a book companion thing that I've made. I did it for, um, uh, my name is Celia. My name is Celia. Me almost Celia. The life of Celia Cruz, and also Ella, Queen of Jazz. So I've done these um, sort of companion things before that are like a set of worksheets and powerpoints and stuff. So basically, with this book, um, the sub reads the book, and then I've created a powerpoint that goes through and gives like a little bit more contextual information with actual pictures of George Gershwin. Um, and then there are also there are links to videos on there. There's um, explanations of some vocabulary things so that like the sub can read the book and then play the PowerPoint and read that and talk through that with students to give them more contextual information. Um, and then I have a, um, a set of like worksheets. So this one asks them like the facts of what they read. George Gershwin heard music as he blank through the streets of New York. A, ran. B, roller skated. C, rode a motorcycle. So like this is like getting them to like make sure they understood what was read to them in the book. Um, on the back, there's a place where they can make a picture that says like, draw a picture that retells the story of the creation of Rhapsody in Blue or is inspired by the music. Okay. Um, there's a lot of like, what do you do? Like a, a thing for the sub, like the lesson outline basically. Because if you don't get a music sub, or even if you do, if you get a sub who subs frequently, they're used to seeing this possible lesson outline usually provided by like McGraw Hill or whatever. So they're used to seeing this. If you have a non-music sub, they will especially like this because it gives them all the details of like, okay, you could do this. You could do this. I have like possible discussion questions, right? Um, pass out worksheets, blah, blah, blah. Like all these things that they could do if they wanted and, and gives them possibilities. And I find subs really like that. Okay. So then Depend and it's also depends on like what grade do you want to do this with you can do what you want So with a younger grade I might do um, there's a coloring page of just George Gershwin on the back It has like roller skates clarinet piano of things that like, you know show up in um, The story so I <laughs> because I know I'm gonna use this for years and years when I when I printed this off I printed off like a, a set of like front and back copy color, coloring pages I printed it off um, like a class set and I did like a one, two, three class sets so that like I would always have something in the sub folder in case they need to pull it out. So I have like a bunch of these because I'm thinking like, you know what? I, I know that I'm gonna use this again. I wanna have these pre-printed and ready to go. So oftentimes when I'm like getting sub plans, instead of just doing the plans for like that day, I will print multiple copies of things that if I think I'm gonna use it again for a different class at another time or, in case the sub needs a backup or whatever. I'll print multiple things. But this is something that I like because it gives a sub an option. First, read the book. Then go through the PowerPoint. There are video links on the PowerPoint that I have previewed, not where they like get on YouTube and look up George Gershwin, no. Like videos that I have like linked, these are good ones. So if they just wanna like read the book and watch the videos, fine. If they wanna read the book and then jump to the worksheet, fine. If they want to read the book and do the discussion questions, cool. If they want to read the book and do coloring pages, amazing. I also think I have a CD at school of Rhapsody in Blue if they wanted to play that. Or it, it's probably a digital file on the sub flash drive I gave. I mean, but I like giving them options because you never know who your sub is going to be. You never know what they're comfortable with. You never know. You know, I mean, like it's good to have options. So with this book, I mean, I, I just like it because it's a super cool book. It talks about the creation of music, what inspired him, not just what inspired him, like the sounds he heard, but like the styles of music he was listening to, why that inspired him, how he grew as a musician, like all these cool things. And then you have all these follow-up options if you want them and if the sub wants them. Like I could use this in class myself if I wanted, you know, but 
I like leaving it for a sub because it gives them options and then they, you know, don't feel like they have to go like sing a song or whatever because some subs are like, you know, they, they'll do anything but that. I don't want to sing. Well, you're subbing for a music teacher, so, you know, <laughs> you don't want to say. It. But I, li I like giving them options of like, here's something that you would maybe see if you were subbing in like a general ed classroom and what you can do. Okay, so giving them options. Great, that's all the stuff about jazz appreciation. That took longer than I was hoping, but surprise, surprise, it's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to talk about that because um, jazz appreciation doesn't just have to happen during Jazz Appreciation Month, which is April, but it can happen any time of the year. So hopefully this gives you some books, ideas, resources you can use going forward. Cool. Okay, let's talk about kindergarten and then we'll talk about um, fifth grade, which I think is... It was just like, as I was teaching the lessons this week, I was like, this is what I want to talk about. And then I was like, it's like the polar opposites of kinder and fifth grade. But I think that's great. Let's talk about kinder and fifth grade. So um, my kindergartners and first graders and second graders, every time they come in, we do a little circle song um, and we, we come sit down. And I like to try and start the class with like a little song, a little game, something. Um, to get them singing, to get them moving, to get them reoriented towards what we do in class. It doesn't always have to be long. It can sometimes be short, but it's, it's, it's good to like expand their vocabulary, expand their song, song library, you know, like to add more. And then also along the way, they're singing more, they're playing more, they're moving, we're resetting expectations. So we always have, I always have like a little song at the beginning. So the song that I pulled is one from Game Plan, um, if you know that curriculum. Um, a lot of times people are like, what curriculum do you use? I'm like, I don't, um, because I, I don't think any one curriculum is, gonna, this is a whole other topic, but I don't think any one curriculum is going to like be the be all end all for you in your classroom. Just because e I mean, no matter what curriculum you use, you're never going to be able to follow it verbatim, like week to week, because there are going to be concerts in there, field trips, thing, you know, so there's no one who's going to like. I will just teach this directly, this one special, this one exact thing the whole year long. I don't think anybody does that. If you do that, please let me know. Um, but we're, I think ever we're always changing. What I love about game plan is if you don't have um, a lot of preset lessons or plans, if you're a newer teacher or if you just want the structure, um, game plan gives that to you and they'll go like week by week what you could do in your lessons. It's sort of, I think it's set up for two lessons a week for like 30 minutes. And so it gives you ideas of like, here's about what, how much time things are going to take. Here's what you're going to do. And it's really, really good about scaffolding things. So like in one lesson, you'll teach a song. Maybe in the next lesson, you'll take that song and you'll add an instrument part. Maybe in the next lesson, you'll take that song and add a movement game or whatever. It builds things up. It spirals them through the curriculum. It's such a well thought out um, curriculum. And I promise I'm not being paid to say this. I just really like it. My school has it. Um, they're about, I think it's like $100 or something for one grade level teacher manual. So that's not a lot of money. If you're like, I'm buying a K-5 curriculum and only spending like six or $700, that's not a lot. I mean, anyway. But so it's pretty accessible, pretty nice to use, all ORF based, love it, great stuff. So, but I don't use it all the time but i definitely jump in and i check it every time i'm lesson planning see like what are they te you know what would they be teaching or because sometimes there are songs that are like seasonal and songs that are like this does fit perfectly at this point in the year with the developmental level of these kids yada 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 great series check it oh another one that's really great purposeful pathways also just super well thought out um and great content spiraled wonderful just another great oh also great teacher tips and purposeful pathways love it i wish i had all of those books i don't i only have a couple anyway so the song that i'm pulling out of game plan is called uh i think it's called like i wrote a letter and it goes like this i wrote a letter to my love and on the way i dropped it one of you has picked it up and put it in your pocket I have a little collar, but it won't fit you, 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 but it will fit you. Oh, it's a fun, it's a fun little song. Anyway, so um, how do you teach the song? I once read an article that was like, a hundred ways to teach a song. There are so many ways you can teach a song. I fall into the, um, 
repetition of teaching by rote and teaching phrase by phrase. Like I whole part whole, where I'll sing the whole thing, I'll sing pieces, they echo, and then we put it all together. That's just like what I've done for so long that just feels natural, and a lot of times I do that. But I don't do that for all songs because I don't think that it works for all songs. If you have a longer song where it has verses or phrases or like verse chorus or it's just more vocabulary, it makes sense to do if you're doing like by rote, if you're not giving them printed music or printed lyrics or whatever. Um, it makes sense to do whole part whole where you sing the whole thing, give them like an understanding sketch of the song, sing phrase by phrase so they get it piece by piece and then put it all together. That makes lots of sense. And for many songs, that's how I teach. But a couple years ago, I was at um, a John Feyerabend workshop and he was saying, you know, if you have a very small song, it does that doesn't make sense. A very short little song, maybe it's just eight measures or whatever. He's like, just if you just keep singing it through, they'll eventually get it, right? And that makes sense. This song, I do something a little bit different. It's not very long, it's sort of short, but I sing it a couple times. The first time I, I sing it, the second time I say, you know what, I think that it's talking about a holiday that either is gonna happen or just happened, or just listen, see if you can hear. I wrote a letter to my love and on the way I dropped it. One of you has picked it up and put it in your pocket. I have a little collar, but it won't fit you, but it won't fit you, but it won't fit you, but it will fit you. It's a cute little song. So they determined that it is a Valentine's Day song, or could be a Valentine's Day song. I wrote a letter to my love, right? So then I say, great, okay, I'm going to quiz you. You've heard it twice. See if you can figure out the words that I leave out. And usually I sing it two, three times. So I'll do like, I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter to my... And they go, love. Yeah, love. I wrote a letter to my love and on the way I... I what? I dropped it. Yes. Okay. Um, I wrote a letter to my love and on the way I dropped it. One of you has... Has done what? has picked it up right and kids are like you know spouting off what the things one of you has picked it up and put it in your pocket yes okay so like so i'll usually for for this lesson anyway I'll, I'll like sing a little bit and then stop see if they remember if they do great if not i'll sing through one more time give them a chance and then i'll start doing this and then what i've been doing this week just to try it out was like okay i'm going to change one word raise your hand when you hear the word that i've changed I wrote a letter to my dad and on the way I dropped it, one of you has, and usually they like, ooh, right away, they'll, they'll like want to stop me because they're like, we heard the one you changed. <laughs> okay, so cool. All right, let me try another. I wrote a letter to my love and on the way I lost it, one of you has, that sometimes trips them up because they don't realize I didn't say dropped it, I said lost it. So. They'll, they'll catch that. Or my favorite one is, I wrote a letter to my love and on the way I dropped it. One of you has picked it up and put it in your backpack. I have a, and then they're like, no, 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 it's not a backpack. It's so uh, I teach it that way, just sort of like I sing the whole thing. I sing it a couple times. I ask them like fill in the blank of the song. And then um, eventually they'll learn enough that they can sing it. The tricky part is that little part at the end because that's really part of a game. And it goes, I have a little collar, but it won't fit you, but it won't fit you, but it won't fit you, but it will fit you. And so um, we talk about, a, you know, the collar of your shirt or for a dog or whatever. Um, and so, but the, the game that they suggest is you walk around with a little scarf or something and you tap people on the shoulder. And it's sort of like duck, duck, goose in that you drop the scarf in front of the kid who you want to stand up or whatever right but i say this is not a chase game it's a race game and so what you have to do is like you know so i'm going around i'm tapping kids and when i drop the scarf in front of you you have to get up because i'm going to run one way and you're going to run the other way and we're going to run around the circle and try and get back to our seating our, our spot whoever gets back to the scarf first wins Ooh. So we sing the whole song. I wrote a letter to my love and on the way I dropped it. One of you has picked it up and put it in your pocket. I have a little collar, but it won't fit you, 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 but it will fit you. And then they run in opposite directions around the circle to try and get back. I have not yet had a kid 
collide with another kid. <laughs> I've always feared that. And my admin walked in today when we were doing the game and I was like, oh no, this would be the worst time for this to happen. But it has not happened. Anyway, um, so they run around. Whoever gets back to the scarf wins. But even if like the kid who is sitting down gets back to their spot first, I always rotate. I always switch. And whoever was chosen gets to stand up. Even if they're like, I beat you or whatever. Anyway, so it's sort of like Duck, Duck, Goose. But I say, instead of a chase, it's a race. You're not chasing each other. You're racing to see who gets back first. Anyway, it's it's like a... The kids love it. It's a cute little song. Um, and I like it for a couple of reasons. It, it, it's a fun game. They like it. It gets them um, singing in a good place in their range. And um, if we focus on it, I have a little collar, but it won't fit you, but it won't fit you. We're tapping on the steady beat. Bum, 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 ba -da -dum, bum, bum, ba -da -dum. And then we're singing too. And then kids also have to sing and then change. When they drop the scarf, they have to change too, but it will fit you. So they have to watch. They have to be engaged watching the kid who's walking around while they're singing. So that's a song that I learned in game plan, but I actually looked it up and I thought I found it in a, another resource book too. So anyway, I'd love to know more about the song and the origin. So if you'll know it, please shoot me a message and I will look it up. So then we go to um, a poem that we've learned. So in the first like week ago, two weeks ago, really, I first introduced Jack Be Nimble, Jack Be Quick. I, I give this long-winded story about I know this kid named Jack when I was growing up, whatever, and he was this great jumper. And so um, he was very nimble. I, like basically I sort of like flesh out the story part of this and we talk about like Jack and he was jumping and yada, yada, yada. Um, and so... Um, we go through into all that and we just do basically a finger play, which is like our fingers acting out the story. So Jack, you know, he's running, he's doing his thing, he's jumping, it's great, until the candle incident and then he burns his toe. It's very sad. But it, I, t I just sort of tell a little story about this kid named Jack and he keeps jumping over bigger and bigger things. He jumps over a bush, he jumps over a pile of basketballs, he jumps over a teacher trying to t tie a kid's shoe, all these things until the candle, in which case he someone had a birthday party out in the playground don't know why but anyway they did and then he jumped over the candle and was not didn't get tra trajectory right anyway and then he burned his toe so then we learn the poem jack be nimble jack be quick jack jumped over the candlestick so usually i have you know like your two fingers you can do on your knee jack be nimble jack be... it looks like feet running right so your your index and your middle finger are just like you know the feet of Jack's body and they get a they get a pounce on your knee. Jack be nimble. Jack be quick. Jack jumped over the candlestick. And then so your fingers jump over. You know, you could have like your index finger of your other hand, you could have a hand jump over. I don't know. It's just a little finger play. This is not integral to the story. It just let it gets them going. Um, so then I add Jack jumped high. Jack jumped low. Jack jumped over and burned his toe. And we do a little cross X fingers for the, the last part. Ouch. Right. So that's how, that's like what we build into. And by the end of the day, hopefully they're doing all those actions. They're doing basically a steady beat on the first part. Jack be nimble. Jack be quick. Jack jump over the candlestick. So they're doing a steady beat. I have them do like patting their knees with both hands by the end of um, the lesson for that steady beat part. Jumped over the candlestick. Jack jumped high. Jack jumped low. So I add in those little bump, 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 bump. Bump, 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 bump. Just clapping high, clapping low. Jack jumped high. Jack jumped low. Jack jumped over and burned his toe. Ouch. Okay, that's just finger play actions. The next time, in the next lesson, when we come back and learn this song, we do the finger play once. We do that finger practice. Then we get our magic sticks. And they're just the rhythm sticks. These, actually, I got these. If you're wondering, well, what are these specific sticks? These, um, I should put this on the links page. I forgot to do that today. But these are, um, they're just lummy sticks. They're plastic lummy sticks. Or you could sometimes see them described as rhythm sticks. I got these from a PE catalog. Um, but they're really, really cool because they are they come in four colors, blue, green, red, and yellow. Um, they're hollow. They make a great sound, um, and they are, like, so durable. I always worry with the wooden ones. Like, they're going to break. They're going to splinter. I'm going to have 
the, I don't know, worst case scenario, they're going to break in some kid's hands and he's going to get like 500 splinters. And, you know, like, I just know that's going to happen. So anyway, these are nice, super durable, bright colors, easy to wipe down, Lysol, whatever. Um, so we do this Jack Be Nimble once with finger play and then we do it with sticks. Jack Be Nimble, Jack Be Quick. Jack jumped over the candlestick. Jack jumped high. Jack jumped low. Jack jumped over and burned his toe. So we try a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, you could do high and low on the stick. You could do different ways to click the stick. We explore lots of things. We just basically take this lesson and sort of use this as a time to like, how do you use hold move sticks? And all the while we're talking about like shoulder holders or under armor, how you, how you where you hold the sticks. If it's clamped underneath your arms and your armpits, we call that under armor. If they're sitting resting on your shoulders, we call them shoulder holders. You can do bug antenna where you have the two of them on your forehead and you're just like all the ways that you can like have a rest position that they think is fun but like just ways that you can have them hold the stick so that they're not clicking because i hate when i'm talking and they're like you know like if i'm giving instructions and they're click that just is so annoying one of my favorites is lumiere where they hold it like the candelabra from beauty and the beast that's a fun one um i do like under armor that's a good one uh, or cool kid pose where they just cross their arms and like look super cool so all great ways to hold the sticks in rest position. But that's like day two of Jack Be Nimble, Jack Be Quick. The third day, which is the one we're currently on, we do Jack Be Nimble, Jack Be Quick as a finger play, and then we pull out instruments. So generally my kindergarten classes are like three rows, sometimes four, depending on the class size, um, of ro like ro a row of kids in my class. It's because I have you know seating charts with sit spots and all that sort of thing. Um, so my kids will come in and, um, and they'll come in we'll do the finger play. We do the song and then the front row of kids, I will give magic mallets. They're not mal magic. They're just the, those rainbow soft mallets you can get. If you ever have a lollipop drum, get a lollipop drum. These come with that. They're just super, super soft. I call them magic mallets cause I don't know. They're, they have a rainbow head. They're super soft. They're nice. So kids get these, they like it. If you're in the front row, that's all you get. <laughs> if you're in the second row, you get a glockenspiel with actual mounts. If you're in the third row, you get a roll over, a xylophone, and play that. So basically, each row is doing something slightly different. Um, we talk with glockenspiels and xylophones about what is high and what is low. We talk about the small bars, big bars, all that. We've been exploring that all year long, so hopefully this is not like a revelation for anyone. Uh, it's, you know, like a... Yeah, of course, we know high and low. Okay, we can find the small bars and the big bars. Cool. And so high and low. And so then if they're playing, either they're going to play with their magic mallets and just play in the air, or they're going to play on glockenspiels, or they're going to play on xylophones. But they're doing one of the three. And then once we finish, you know, going through and trying it, they put their mallets to sleep on the bars or on the ground. And then we rotate. So the magic mallet kids go to the xylophones. The xylophones go to the glockenspiels. The glockenspiels go to the magic mallets. You play through, you do it, you rotate again. So every kid will get a chance at all three things um, by the end, but they're not, you know, that we're rotating. So a couple things I like about that, the rotation so that they get all the instruments. I like having a row of magic mallets because that means there's at least one row of kids who are not making the world's loudest sounds because you know those glockenspiels are loud. And having a whole class full of glockenspiels, no thanks. But also that means if you don't have a full like instrumentarium, class set of instruments, then you can say like, okay, well, I can put some in the second row, some in the third row. And then you're not, you're not worried about like, oh, I don't know enough for everyone, you know. Because I don't, also, I don't want to manage all the, all the kids in the whole class playing instruments. That would be crazy. And so the kids in the front, you could even have like a row of mallets and a row of sticks if you wanted. Um, but the, ma the mounts are nice because they are very quiet. <laughs> the, even the sticks would be loud. Um, so that, that's why I like having a, a row of the magic mallets. Plus also then at every spot they're in, they're playing, they have mallets in their hands. Even though they're not playing with these mallets, they have mallets. And so in the other two places, they have either yarn mallets or hard mallets, depending on the instrument they're on. But the whole time they're experiencing what it's like to hold mallets, even though the front row, they're not playing anything. So that's Jack Be Nimble, Jack Be Quick. And that's sort of our, where we finalize with that. You could absolutely do a lesson with movement. You could do it with something else. But this is like sort of where we get to um, with this poem. Super fun. And, and it's fun to be able to use the poem because most of them, 
either have heard it or will hear it again. It's a, a great, great poem to use. Cool. Okay. But that's not all in one lesson. That's in three lessons. First, we learn it in one. The next time we do you rhythm six. The next time we add on instruments. But I don't try and cram it all into one because that would be crazy. And also too much to try and get them to do. But it's nice to like, I would not put the instrument in their hand if they didn't have experience with the poem, experience playing while the speed, you know, like I, I want them to have all of that before, before we get too far. Okay, cool. So that's kindergarten. Let's jump to fifth grade. Fifth grade, we've been we've been doing a lot of inst of orf instruments, so like pitch percussion instruments. Um, we've been doing a lot of like performative stuff. Um, we did some folk dance and things in the last couple of months. There's a lot. We haven't really done as much rhythm reading or creating or things like that. So I spend some time in this lesson doing that. And over the course of two lessons. Um, the first lesson we do like a folk dance or sort of, a, you know, folk dance from back in the fall or whatever. Um, and then spend some of the time doing instrument creation. And then the second lesson, it's all not instrument creation, rhythm creation. And the second lesson, it's all rhythm creation. So let me sort of show you how I do that. So, um, I shared before about how I play this game called magic number with kids. Um, and I started it with second grade just to see if it would work. It did. Um, and so in, I'll, I'll show you how I modify it for my my fifth graders. Um, I use an iPad to project up on the screen. If you don't have that option, you can just use a whiteboard. You can use an, um, a document camera or whatever to, to just to have a visual for kids to see. All my kids have whiteboards, markers, and erasers um, that I have in the room that I pass out or whatever. Um, and so then they'll have that so they can create. So let me just show you what I show them. And Instagram, I'm going to turn you around here so you can see. And then let me switch to this. So here's what my students see. Um, so this is an app on my iPad called Sketches School. I'm pretty sure it's free in the app store, but I, because it's one that like my district tech team allows us to download so I'm pretty sure it's free otherwise we wouldn't be able to get it for get it for all of our iPads anyway it's called sketches school so basically what I say is to kids the first day we do this when we're first learning the game um, I just have them put in one bar line and then over here I say okay the magic number game here's how it works the number on top is the magic number yeah so there's the magic numbers four. there's a line and then there's a ta underneath okay so this means that you can fill in this space with four ta's, yeah? And on the other side, you can add in four more ta's. Easy peasy. And so that's what we do. We do the line, we do magic number, and then I go, oh no, see, and I shared this a couple weeks ago, so I'm not gonna go too in depth. Oh no, the magic number has changed to five. Okay, so then they're gonna have to go in and find a spot to add another ta. Okay, oh, and then by the time they do that, I go, oh no. The magic number it's changed and they're like rats mr ross stop okay so then they have to go in and erase to sort of make it fit so this is just like a chance for them to like time signatures how do they work basics right so then um once we've done that and they've tried it i go back to four uh, okay so the four is the magic number and then i say oh, they're like, oh mr Rao, quit messing with these and they say actually you know um you know ta Right, And you know that there are other things that we can put in its place that are the same value. Because ta is worth one beat, right? So what are some other things that we can put in place of ta if we wanted? Okay, well, you could put two eighth notes, so ta D. That would work. You can put in a quarter rest, a ta rest. That's also worth one beat. One beat of silence, but one beat. You could also put in... Takadini, right? Or a set of four sixteenth notes. You know, that, that's equal to one beat, right? My fifth graders also know, hopefully, that they can do Tadini, so, or t tika, whatever you call it, which is an eighth note plus two sixteenth notes barred together. Or they can do Takadi, tika t, um, which would be two sixteenth notes and one eighth note beamed together. They could do those. So I say, we talk, I talk, I use this analogy of a pizza. If you go to a pizza store, a pizza store, a restaurant, and you order like a basic pizza, like a just a, you know, 
first pizza. It, it's a cheese pizza. Like, that's the basic pizza, right? If you want a cheese pizza, that's fine. A cheese pizza is this on the top line. It is just four, four taws on one side of the bar line, four taws on the other side of the bar line. That fits the rules of the magic number being four and four what? Four taws. That is fine. You can do that if you want. But maybe you want a pepperoni pizza. Okay, so then, you you know, let's take one of these things from our, our options down here and let's substitute. So I think I'm going to add in this first ta, I'm going to change to a ta D. And then in the second one, in the second measure, I'm going to change the second one to a ta D. So it's going to, instead of reading ta, 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 right? It's going to be ta D, ta, 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 D, ta, ta. Ooh, fine. Interesting. More interesting than just a cheese pizza. But maybe somebody wants like, I don't know, like a combo, like a cheese pizza and sausage, or sorry, pepperoni and sausage. Okay, well then let's change some other things in here. Let's throw in a rest in both measures. Oh, I don't ever want to do that. Oh, we'll take this one out. Okay. Ooh, great. Oh, you know what? Maybe somebody wants a Hawaiian pizza or maybe a taco pizza, maybe Supreme. Maybe they want uh, stuffed crust. I don't know, but you got to make it more interesting. So let's change out some other things. Okay, so let me take that and I'm going to do... Okay, and this one. Okay, so as they're doing this, what I'm looking for is to see that kids are not making some of those basic note value errors. Like, I don't want them to do this and call it a Takadimi. I don't, you know, like I want to make sure that instead of just ta di ta di I want to make sure they have that second beam on top. That's always something I'm looking for because kids all the time accidentally leave it off and then that is a, I mean, then that's two, that's four eighth notes instead of four sixteenth notes. That's a big deal. Okay, I'm also looking for, with younger grades, I would be looking for, are they putting the stem on the right side? Or are they putting it on the left side? Does it look like a D or does it look like a B? That's also something I'm looking for. I did that with older grades too, but mostly with younger grades. So those are just some like logistical things I'm looking for. I'm also looking to see that they actually understand you must have only four things on each side. And the cool thing about what we're doing right now is we're using some complex rhythmic elements. So 16th notes and 16th note, eighth note pairs, right? We're pairings, we're putting those in even though we're only doing two measures with four beats each. But we're still getting more interesting because we've got these more interesting rhythms. Okay. So then, um, if you want, you could say, well, if I want one ta, fine. But if I want, you know, two ta's, I could put in, you know, a half note. A half note is worth two beats. Or I could do a half rest. So, like, you could get into, like, well, if you're going to put that in, you got to wipe out two other things. So you, you could put it, you could go into that note value if you wanted. Right? That's an option. Um, another thing I'll do, usually on the second day of doing this, instead of just doing one line... I will do this. I'll do four lines. And you can see I've already started this with kids of talking about what can you change out, what can you do. So that there are four lines. And basically what I have kids do is like we start, we just make four lines of just ta. So that's um, what, 16 measures? No, sorry, eight measures. <laughs> Counting ahead of myself. It's eight measures. And in each one I have four ta's. Right, so four quarter notes in each one. And then we go back and sort of change one or two things in each measure to make it slightly more interesting. So what I'm having kids do now, this is usually the second day of this sort of lesson, is um, kids are going through and making those changes so they have, um, in each measure, something more interesting than just four taws, right? And so then what they do in the end of once they've created, changed, whatever, then they have to go back and read it. They have to read the whole thing. And some kids are like, fine, I can copy down and change things, but then can't read that rhythm. So once they go through and read it, I say, if you need to make changes, you can make changes. Maybe you change something to make it more interesting, but you made it way too interesting. You know, you made it tricky, tricky to read. Well, then change that, you know. So this is when we go back and like reassess what we've done and think about like, well, you know, and this is, the, this is a higher level thinking thing. I made these changes, they're fine, but... It's not as easy to read anymore. So like, you know, maybe you throw in like um, takadimi takadi and that's tricky to get. Or maybe you do 
too many Takadimis or whatever you do, <clears throat> you can then go back and change that if you want. So like right now, if you look at my example, the top two lines have been altered, but then the bottom two are still just straight, you know, quarter notes. So I'd have them go in and change some of those things. So they go through, they read it, they make sure that it's the way they like it, and then, then they can get a pair of rhythm sticks and then they have to read it and play it. And so we do that, we take a couple minutes, again, if they need to change something now that we have a different function for what this is for, it might be that some of your rhythms are too complex, too hard to play, maybe they're too easy to play, maybe you're bored, so you would go back and make changes again based on, you know, the next step. Well, it doesn't work as well now that I'm using six, or now that I'm using rhythm six. Okay, let's change that, right? So, um, so they can go in and make those changes. Then I have them put their board with someone else, and then they have to... Um, here, I'm going to turn this around. So then they have to go with someone else and they have to um, uh, have that other person read. So they can choose, they can quiz the other person um, and they can have the other person read um, the, it, I usually say not the whole thing. I usually say like a line of your choosing. So like you can go through like a tricky line, easy line, I don't really care. And they can go through and have that other kid read. So it either you could do like quiz them, like Ooh, read my rhythm, or you can t have them teach it to them. Today, I, I've done it two ways with two different classes. I did one where they quizzed the other kids. The other kid had to read the rhythm they gave them. That was fine. I did it another way where I said like, you know, one kid is like, okay, here's the one. I'm going to do it for you. And then I'm going to teach it to you. And you're going to do it with me. Either way, you're getting kids to read other kids' rhythms. Sometimes that means you're going to have to make more changes with the composition because, again, it's too easy, too hard, too whatever. Um, but kids get to go through and sort of play with that. And then, again, with rhythm sticks, they get to try it out. You could have them do one line from each kid's composition. You could have them do the whole composition. You could have them do less. I mean, whatever you want to do. You could have them share with another group. There are like infinite possibilities with this, but I, I like it for a couple reasons. One, it has them composing, um, or at least working with note values. It's then note reading, playing, working with another person, um, assessing, evaluating, did I make good choices when I was arranging, composing, and why? Um, and so, so there are lots of fun options. You could also take it to a pitch percussion instrument. You could have them write it down and save it for the next time, and then reuse it and try again with that. I mean, like, there are lots and lots of options. But but giving them that sort of format of like, we're starting with just straight taws and then we're changing things. For me, that's worked better than just like, here, you have eight completely empty measures. Fill in with whatever. I find there are so many more mistakes about what kind of notes and how many notes you can have. Um, and they overload or they mess things up. Starting with saying like, here's the baseline, go in and change. Where you're like, here, just you know, 32 ta's, go in and change them or whatever. That somehow makes more sense to them. I don't know. And if, if y'all are out there and you're like, I agree, I've done something like this, or you're like, no, that's, you know, that's cool. Please let me know in the comments. But like, this is what we're doing currently right now. And it's working pretty well. And, it, and again, maybe it's wouldn't work so well if we'd been doing more of this. But because we've had like a bunch of time off between the last time we did this and now, it's like a good refresher, gets things in their head. Um, they're working with other kids, they're playing it, they're reading it, they're arranging and changing. I like all that stuff. The other thing that I'm liking specifically about this is because we're, I'm making sure that they use at least one or two of the eighth notes and 16th note combos. So like the ticka T or T ticka, taka D or ta D me, if they're doing that, um, those are more complex and tricky. And so this gives them good experience with that. A couple follow-ups that I have, um, you could then make this like a transition to like talking about GarageBand or talking about uh, Chrome Music Lab if you have iPads for that. Um, and then this is like a good lead in if you're doing like the beat sequencer in GarageBand because then they have like set things where they can change and do things. So that's sort of cool. This sort of like teaches them what to think about once they're doing GarageBand. If they're doing Chrome Music Lab, it's another one where they sort of are thinking ahead to their composition, making changes if they don't like it, making changes if it doesn't feel as good. So um, talking with them about the compositional process is great. So if you have that, cool. But also then I have a couple QR games that I've made in the last year that are like 16th note and especially like um, you can either, there's one where it's like you hear it and then you tap the corresponding rhythm or um, you see a word and figure out the corresponding rhythm. So it's like um, this is good practice for especially the 16th note combos so then we can go and apply it later.
anyway, I also like this because like I with my iPad, I can you know put put the images up on the board. I can walk around and check check in with kids who really need it, and I can then differentiate and be like, okay, you're doing good, or this is great, but let's change this thing, or ooh, I noticed you forgot that you know. It gives me a chance to check in with each kid and sort of go around. Um, especially when they're playing each other compositions, it's great to go and see what they did and see if they really are playing or not. I get a lot of data out of this. I get a lot of information about how much they actually know. Okay, cool. If you've tried this uh, with second grade, because I, ta I talked about ma the magic number game with second grade, obviously that was simplified. We didn't use 16th notes. We didn't do any of that stuff. It was a simplified version of this. The, the process works for all grades, but you can just change out... Um, you can change out the complexity based on the rhythms, the, the, the note values that you use. Um, so on Instagram, you're saying you like that the quarter notes are there because it gives that understanding of steady beat being worth quarter notes. Yes. It also just gives them like a baseline of like, here's what you can do and then just change this one thing. It, it's especially helpful when you change out half notes because then they realize like two things have to go away to make room for this one half note. I, when I just had a blank space, I feel like they didn't get that quite as easily. So having the two notes there already that then you had to take away to put in a half note, I feel like it it solidifies this idea of the two beats. I don't know. Um, but try it out. See if it works for you. Come back. Yell at me. Send me an email. This didn't work. It was terrible. <laughs> or like, it worked and here's how I changed it or whatever. I'd love to hear those um, those thoughts. Okay, so today we talked about jazz appreciation books, jazz history month books. Um, if you're interested, like I said, I have a whole link on my Amazon page that's just all jazz books. Um, so go check that out if you want, but you don't have to buy them on Amazon. You can, um, but you can get them from your library. You can get them from book websites. That's all there. That was at the beginning of the video. And then I also talked about kindergarten, specifically Jack Be Nimble, Jack Be Quick, and how I transfer that from the poem to finger play to instruments. And then we finished up with fifth grade and talking about composition and quizzing each other. Um, I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions or ideas or thoughts, please send me an email. My email is makemomentsmatter at gmail.com. Um, or you can leave a comment, question, whatever on the video or on wherever you're watching, listening to this. And I hope you come back next week for another Musical Mondays video. Have a great week making music with your students, everyone. Bye.